Jeremy Pollock, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thanks. Glad to be here. Appreciate it. Yeah, well, I'm really glad to have you. And you reached out to me uh, uh, saying that you had listened to Shrink Wrap Radio and you'd love to be a guest, and I'm glad you did. I need to do a little bit of market research here with you on, on Shrink Wrap Radio. Uh, so uh, do you remember how you discovered Shrink Wrap Radio? I think I was looking, um, I was looking for psychology related uh, podcasts on, I can't, iTunes maybe or something like that. I was just looking for um, something and I found yours and it, and it seemed very much aligned with what I was looking for. So yeah, that's how I found okay. it. Okay, good. good. I recently listened to the, uh, the one on psychedelics. Oh, uh, yeah. I lo- I, yeah, I, lo- I think that's a very fascinating subject, yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, do you care to uh, let us know or not where you are with psychedelics? You know, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm, you know, listen, I'm open-minded and if, uh, if, 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 if they can do, you know, valid research and they can show some positive effect, uh, significant with a, a population of people, I think it's worth exploring. Oh yeah, definitely. And fortunately that research has, has begun to happen. It kind of got closed down yeah. years ago. Uh, and uh, and now it's starting to happen, and there's a lot more that we need to learn. But uh, yeah. I'm really excited by it, and so there will be more interviews on psychedelics, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, and I, I think what I mean maybe this is off topic, but I just you know I, I know that a lot of people use particular psychedelics for therapeutic or for like spiritual growth, those kinds of yeah. purposes. And um, you know, without proper uh, scientific oversight or research. They're just kind of doing it on their own, and if and if there was a medical basis for doing this, I think that would be great. So yeah, I'm I'm all for the research. Yeah, well, actually, it's not off topic if we look at it just right, because you're into conflict resolution, yeah. and it may be that you know I have the impression that uh, people personality and value systems shift often as a result of psychedelic experiences. So sort of indirect, I wouldn't necessarily advise having two parties each on psychedelics and trying to do conflict <laughs> resolution. Uh, on the other hand, I think people did experiment with MDA. I think therapists have used MDA before it was legal, I think, or before it became illegal and then it became illegal. But I think they may have done some couples work because MDA has the rep- reputation of kind of opening up the heart and getting people into a heart space. So yeah, may- maybe it has been used for conflict re- resolution with couples. Yeah, listen, I mean, I, I, they're doing all kinds of interesting research with MDA, MDMA and and or is it MDA? I don't I don't know how they pronounce. It. I don't know. MDMA, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, I wouldn't put a, that would be an, a very interesting study once they yeah. get, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe you'll get to be involved with that at some point down that the road. Be, that would, be, that would yeah. be very interesting, yeah. Yeah. Well, before we dive into your work, I just want to let you know that I was very impressed by your website. It's very, very complete and uh, really uh, just very rich in content and really establishes your authority. And, and I'm sure that's, Oh, thank one you. of your goals, and that's the way it came across to me. Yeah, well, uh, thanks. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm traditionally a, a content person, so I, I, I started out my sort of professional career as a content writer, and so I've, I've done that for uh-huh. a while. I eventually got into psychology and conflict resolution and stuff. Okay, so that explains it. Well, how did you get into conflict resolution? And let's. Um, just go way back. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so I mean, I, I've been a lifelong martial artist, and I think that kind of introduced me to the world of peace and conflict. Um, I I got used to dealing to sort of dealing on a primal level with confrontation in that form, but in a controlled way, and I and I thought that was very helpful, and it gave me a lot of confidence, etc. And um, I had some interesting experiences during college that were slightly that were fairly traumatic um that dealt with conflict you know sort of very survival level conflict and it led me into 
getting psychotherapy to help with the trauma. And that opened my eyes to the world of psychology. And so I started as a layman, just, you know, reading about psychology and self personal growth and that kind of stuff. And um, eventually, after several years of more martial arts study and more just sort of, you know, lay psychology research, I got, um, I started coaching individuals. Some of my students asked me, asked me to coach them. Um, and, I, and I got to learn how to coach. And as a, just like a personal development coach, a life coach, et cetera. And then, um, and then I got interested in the academic side of, uh, of psychology. And so I, I volunteered and started working at a lab at UCLA in the evolutionary psychology department, which is, which is where my foundation, my research foundation has been is evolutionary psychology. And uh, that, and through that, I sort of research and, and under, you know, trying to look at conflict and cooperation, the evolution of conflict and cooperation as it relates to human psychology. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, they, uh, is is the trauma something that you're willing to talk about? I always like to get personal, and you know, my background is as a, as a yeah, yeah. therapist, so I my instinct is to dive yeah. in a bit. Yeah, when I was when I was 18, I, I was about a month out out of my parents suburban house you know in uh in right outside of los angeles and i went to usc for a college and that's in you know sort of downtown los angeles and i've never lived i know it well i grew up in la okay yeah Yeah. not too far from usc actually okay so so i do you know where agora hills is then i recognize the name but i don't i this is a long time ago that i was in la agora hills might not have existed then at least not not my name smaller suburb yeah but um but anyway so i i was there the first month i was there i was i was kidnapped at knife point by a gang member who was on a basically a gang initiation to uh, probably to, to to kill a a you know a college kid oh wow so he, he that is traumatic yeah, yeah. So he, he he forced me to drive him in my car and um we drove way into the into the basically into East LA. I didn't recognize where I was. It was it was a very you know it was basically I don't know where I was. It was uh, East LA, deep East LA, and um, we finally got off the freeway. And he told me to go up into this neighborhood. And I and I and at that point I had been studying martial arts for a while. I had done very limited uh, knife work, um, so working with knives and defending against knives. But I was I was somewhat competent and and confident that I could deal with it if I had to. And I and and I got into a state. When I was when I was in the situation, I was very clear. It was interesting. I was very clear. I wasn't very afraid. Um, the the fear came later, but right in that moment, I was very much in a survival mode, and so I was I was extremely present, and it was a, it was an amazing feeling, and I was extremely confident. And I remember very clearly thinking to myself that you know I am not going to die tonight, and I knew what was going on. I knew that he was taking me somewhere to to kill me, wow. and um, because I just didn't. That was the only thing that made sense. He wasn't. He wouldn't t- talk to me. He just told me to drive, and uh, so I knew what was going on. And, and I just thought, if I go up into this neighborhood, I'm gonna. He's gonna take me somewhere where his buddies are waiting. I'm gonna die, and so I need to. I need to either right now. I need to fight him and and potentially kill him, or I need to get out of my car somehow without him noticing yeah. and starting to stab me or something. Yeah. So I, so I was able to think, luckily I was able to get my seatbelt off without him noticing. And while I was driving, going about 35 miles an hour, I, I opened the car door and jumped out. You bailed, yeah. I bailed, yeah. So I was able to hit the ground. I was very good at rolling because of martial arts. So I hit the ground, I, was, I rolled. And so I didn't, I didn't break anything luckily. I just, I just got cut up by the asphalt. But, uh, but I, I was then able to, I, I ran into, I, I found a corner store, I ran, I, and there was a police officer in the, in the intersection, I flagged him down, and they, I was basically, I was, I was safe. But, uh, oh. but yeah, so I, I, I had to deal with that, and, um, and that opened my eyes to this world of, of qu- conflict on a primal level, and, uh, and I got very much into martial arts, and much more into security, and it's like executive protection type of training. Oh yeah. Now let, let me just back you up a little bit. I'm wonder, wondering what happened with the guy and the car because you, it was still going when you yeah, yeah. He, he Well, we were going up a hill, so it must have slowed down enough for him to jump in. He took off in it, and uh, it, they found the car about a week later. It was all stripped, no uh-huh. tires or anything like that. So, um, so and they never found him, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Wow, that that is a traumatic experience, and I yeah. I, uh, I I really uh, like the way you described how present you were in the moment, and I think that probably the martial arts training that you had, I was involved with martial arts too, but not as deeply as you. I got as far as uh, a brown belt in judo. Okay. And, and I took a, also some uh, a, a indescribable class in college that was martial arts oriented and a little weird. Uh, so it's, it's glad that that, I mean, I'm glad to hear that that training clicked in at a certain level and that you had you know i know that in the the teachers that i had they always emphasized that the best thing to do is run <laughs> if yeah. you ha if, if that's an option that's what i kept thinking mike i remember my teacher who 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 i worked with with the knife briefly and he i just remember him saying if you can get away from a knife get away from a knife don't fight a knife you know yeah. because it's yeah. so dangerous it's worth yeah. I think it's more dangerous than a firearm up close. Yeah, right. It's a little bit easier to handle up close. Okay. And um, the, and I know that the martial arts discipline that you were, or maybe still are, I think you got a black belt in Hapkido? Yeah, black belt in Hapkido, and then I moved on to other arts, and then I became uh -huh. I kickboxing instructor and mixed martial arts instructor and stuff like that. And, and you were also were in the military police, so was that before or after? Yeah, that, where was that in the in the chronology? That was just a few years ago, actually. I was I was in my thirties, and I and I right before I, I think there's the cutoff is like thirty five. Actually, for I was in the state military reserve. And California has a state military reserve, which is a, a component of the Army National Guard, and so I I was able to get into that. I got I was I did two years of service, uh, in wow. twenty fourteen to twenty sixteen. Yeah, so that's certainly another level of of uh, conflict. Yeah. Res uh, resolution right yeah i've been i've been very interested in all sort of aspects because you know on some level martial arts if you had to defend yourself is a way of resolving a conflict but it's not the way that i prefer to resolve a conflict and a good a good teacher a good martial arts teacher will help you understand how to resolve conflicts without using physical aggression essentially uh -huh. so wow yeah, yeah. uh it was a, it was an interesting route into kinds of conflict studies yeah yeah, were there any other influences in your early life that sort of uh, sensitized you to conflict and, uh, you know, kind of headed you in this direction? Like, did you grow up in a family that was full of conflict or? Well, so interesting, like, so my family was, is, is, is the opposite. My family is very well functioning. Right. Um, and everybody, you know, we're very close. And so um, it, it, it wasn't full of conflict. We had... Only when I was an adult, there was there was some issues with you know, but but just general life issues that 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 came up, uh, but no con inter not really interpersonal conflict. Okay. So um, so again, I think that contrast between coming from that sort of lifestyle into being basically kind of like assaulted, and then going and living in the city and starting to deal into the world and getting into business and seeing how much conflict there was in business. I mean. You know, once I once I started working for people, it was just amazing the amount of conflict I was seeing in offices and workplaces. Yeah. I mean, the first people I worked for, the there was two females that were the heads of the companies, and I remember them screaming at each other in front of everybody. One time, one of them threw a stapler at the other one, and it hit the wall, and it's like in front of everybody. It was in front of the whole office, and I thought, wow, this is this is something, you know. So that. that <laughs> That was really interesting too, in terms of like how do how do you deal with conflict? Well, how do you manage your own emotions and self you know self regulate in order to effectively communicate with people? And so I think, yeah, uh, yeah. That, so that part also, of what part of what you discovered as you were more in the world was that you would have a, a lot of potential customers <laughs> for conflict resolution. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't even. Yeah, at that point I wasn't thinking about it, but I, absolutely. Once I once I started getting into this as a as a profession. It was, I, it, it, it morphed from coaching. So I was a coach for a long time and I still am a coach. And a lot of my, a lot of my coaching clients are entrepreneurs, small business owners. Some of them are executives at big companies. So, and, and what I was starting to find was a lot of the things I was dealing with when I was coaching individuals was, it was kind of like 50% internal conflict and 50% yeah. on conflict with other people. A lot of them had problems with their 
employees, with their business partners, with their customers, et cetera. And I was, I was coaching them a lot on how to communicate better with that. And I thought, you know, maybe I should become more of an expert on, on this, on, on resolving conflict between people, not just within people. And so I, that's why I kind of got interested in, in going and getting a degree in conflict. Yeah. Do you find that there's a relationship between conflict within and conflict without? Um, oh, absolutely. Um, uh, it, it, it all starts from within. So if someone is in, in conflict with themselves, they will create conflict outside. And if someone experiences a conflict externally and they become in conflict internally within themselves, they will not be able to communicate effectively. They won't be able to manage their emotions. So the, the, the point is, what I really try to do when I coach people in terms of, within this realm is help them get to a place of internal peace. That's, that's very important. And help them also understand how to regulate their internal peace when conflict arises outside of themselves. Because if you get triggered and you get emotionally triggered and you, you start feeling the heat, it's very hard to communicate effectively. It's very hard to, to resolve any kind of conflict. You'll probably just get yourself into worse conflict. Yeah, yeah. So what do you do uh, in that first phase to uh, get them to be at peace with themselves? How do you? Well, I, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's similar to, I was in psychotherapy for a long time after the trauma and then I, was oh, yeah. and then I, and then I got into coaching and I think coaching, my style of coaching is similar. It's similar to like cognitive behavioral therapy where I'm, I'm looking at, I want to understand what's not working in a person's life. And then we start to dive into, well, why is it not working? What's going on in the inside that's stopping you from achieving the goals you want to achieve, but also stopping you from just being in a state of peace most of the time. And then we start talking about that and starting to change the stories. Everyone has this internal narrative or several narratives happening. And uh, I mean, you know this as, as a therapist, but um, yeah. everyone has these narratives happening. And the, 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 the goal for me is which narratives are not working to help this person be and remain at a state of peace. And let's start to look at those and then change the narratives. And we have to do uh -huh. that consciously by telling yourself conscious stories to override the old sort of unconscious or subconscious stories. Right. So, so does that mean that you were uh, in a, a, a CBT type therapy for your trauma? Um, I don't know that it was CBT, you know, I think I got I, initially when I was in when I was doing it for trauma, it wasn't as much CBT. It was a little bit more psychoanalysis. I kind of um, she was my therapist was. I don't know how to describe her. She was a, she was a psychologist, but she was very she was like almost like a spiritual psychologist. She was she was very open minded in the way she did did things. She had me do EMDR within the second session, and that I couldn't believe how powerful that was. Oh really? Yeah, yeah I hadn't I hadn't you know EMDR. I actually interviewed the uh, originator of it. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, that, I, I do know something about it, but not yeah, from an experiential standpoint. I hadn't, I hadn't cried in years at that. When I, when I, I went to see a therapist after college at about 22 and I hadn't cried since I was probably 10 years old. I didn't, you know, I was at, I was at a point where I was like not able to feel. Yeah. That's why I went to therapy because I was so repressed from the traumas and, um, and I went to therapy and she did EMDR and with, within the first session of EMDR, I completely broke down crying. All these memories came back from not, not even, I had another trauma during college. My, my roommate passed away and I, oh. and he was my friend and I found his dead body. That's oh, um, yeah. so that, that was the first thing that came up in the EMDR and, and just, just, just sort of crying about that. But yeah, it was a, I was so so I don't know what kind of therapy I guess she would call herself, but eventually I started getting when I got past those traumas, I got interested in just my life in general. And yeah. I started and I started kind of getting more nuanced about what was not working for me, what was going on for me in my head, um, and in my behavior. And I then I started working with different therapists and I think eventually I kind of went into that CBT realm. Yeah. That's, that's all fascinating. And part of the reason why I'm, I'm asking about that is uh, trauma is a very big topic these days. And I've uh, been doing a lot of interviews around trauma and different approaches to dealing with trauma. So that's why I was particularly interested to, it, yeah. you know, it may seem like I'm just wandering around here. No, no, no. It's, it's yeah. important. I, 
I part of part of what I do when I coach and try to help people figure out what are those narrative those are early narr those deep narratives that are not working and why they're causing particular maladaptive behaviors. A lot of times we get to trauma that they experienced early in childhood and stuff like that. And again, I'm not a psychotherapist, so I'm not trying to necessarily un uncover or deal with trauma on that level, but it's important for me to know. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, I was interested that you got an, a master's degree in anthropology. Yeah. And why anthropology instead of psychology? Yeah, I was, well, so I was very interested in evolutionary psychology. And, um, and so there was a particular program and a particular um, advisor that I wanted to work with at Cal State Fullerton, his name is John Patton. He was my, he was my supervisor for my master's. And, um, and so I, uh, so yeah, so I, you know, so I wanted to work, he was an anthropologist, an evolutionary anthropologist, and they had a great master's in evolutionary anthropology there. Um, I wasn't ready for a PhD program at that point. So, uh, so I, so I decided to apply for a master's and I got into that. And it was really an ev evolutionary psychology is a, is a, is a, it, it can be either studied under psychology or it could be studied as under anthropology. And so yeah. I, I kind of studied it under anthropology. I, I got another, I got a master's in conflict resolution separately from that. Cause that's more oh. of a applied program. And now I'm getting my PhD in psychology. So, yeah, yeah. And uh, what, what's the orientation of your PhD program? It's, it's, it's motivation and performance psychology. That's sort of the emphasis. My, well, my that really fits into your whole coaching direction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm interested in what motivates behavior. So um, I, I'm, my theoretical approach is through a human needs. And this is also comes from stems a lot from conflict resolution is a human needs approach. So there's all these human needs theories, you know, like Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. Yeah. John, Bart, John Burton was a conflict resolution specialist and he wrote a book on applying human needs theories to conflict resolution and what puts people in conflict. And then there's things called like self-determination theory um, from um, these researchers, Ryan and Desi, who has this, there's just a huge program of empirical research on basic psychological needs that human beings have. And so that's my theoretical approach to trying to understand conflict from that perspective. That's how I look at conflict is what needs are being, are either perceived as being threatened or thwarted by what forces and how do we get those needs better satisfied? And so if, if two individuals are basically perceiving either both or one of the parties as, as hindering them from getting their needs met, the question is, okay, is, is that true? Is that perception of, of threat real? And if not, what, what can we do to satisfy those needs and get, you, get everyone's needs met in a better way? So that's the theoretical approach I came from. Yeah, and that's the impression that I got from your website, uh, does, that, that really uh, makes sense to hear you talk about it that way. Um, peace building is a term that you use. I think it's even in the name of your website, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so when I saw that, I sort of went off maybe in the wrong direction, thinking that you were involved in international work, you yeah, know, trying to bring peace to to between Israel. that's the way it's traditionally been used yeah, and the, <laughs> yeah. the palestinians right yeah do you see yourself eventually maybe heading in that direction i would love to do that work and i and i work with some individuals that do that sort of work um you know it's 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 a lot of work it's it's tough work it, it and there's really no way of making a, a solid living at it unless you're working for like a some sort of ngo or you're working for the state yeah. or something and so right um, I like being a consultant, so I can't make a loop, but I certainly at some point would love to get involved more, even as a volunteer in that level. Yeah, you're reminding me that I had an, uh, an interview actually with somebody who was sort of in that NGO world doing that kind of work. Mm. I, I can't even remember the details of it now. I've done so many interviews, but you might enjoy hunting for that one, or I'll, I'll find it and maybe send you a link to it. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. I think you'd be interested in it. Um, I, I, I use the term because for, I, I, I use those, the same methodologies essentially that they use in those sort of conflicts. I kind of apply, I take those and I apply them to smaller organizational levels, to community levels. And that's, I, I didn't realize this, but that, that's something that I hear from my clients 
is that that's a unique approach. I didn't know that that was a unique, I thought sort of that was what is done. It just seems intuitive to me. But from when I work with clients and they reach out to me, it seems like they're surprised. Like they, they haven't heard of the kind of service that I provide, which is basically how do I go into an organization and assess a particular conflict or, the, or a culture of conflict and help them mitigate it, help them get back to a place of peace, help them get a place of productivity and that kind of thing. And I use the same, generally the same methodologies in an applied fashion with organizations. Yeah, so uh, on your website, you mentioned several venues that you work in. I think it was uh, organizations, individuals, and communities. Yeah. And uh, by the way, as, as we talk about this, if you have any stories, I'd love to hear stories about, uh, and you don't have to give the names of people, yeah, yeah. Or organizations, if, if, if it's inappropriate to do yeah. that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to, happy to share different, different stories that I've seen that really, I mean, there's like, I, I go back to this, to, to one that I often talk about, which is a surprise, which is a surprising one. I've seen this happen a few times, but not so dramatically, but so there was a, there was a company I was dealing with where they called me in to help mitigate a conflict. And the idea, the, 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 the proposal to me was that there's this one individual and she's a high level executive, but she's, she's very valuable. They don't want to lose her. However, there's all kinds of conflict with her. She wants to do her own thing. She doesn't want to listen to her boss, which is the CEO essentially. And um, so the C and the, so her and the CEO are not getting along. Then her and some other department heads are not getting along, etc. And these are very like sort of high powered, um, uh, bus- you know, business people. These two are, are women, but they're it was it was a women run company actually, and there, it was. Um, everybody's sort of stuck in their positions. And so I came in and I started, inter- I, I do interviews with the, everyone individually first before I do. Them. Okay. Yep. And, uh, and what I found was that it wasn't all that it was cracked up to be when it was proposed to me. It was like one person, the other person has the conflict. Welcome to the world of consulting, right? Right. right. And, the, and the, the other, you know, this one saw this one is conflict and this one who the other one saw was conflict didn't think it was, it was, it was just like, it was all kinds of inter- different stories than what I was originally and then when I got them into a dialogue session, I, what I call is like, like a transformative mediation because my goal is not to have them walk away from each other with something. My goal is to, for them to come together and move forward together in a relationship. And so it's kind of more like a facilitated dialogue is what I do to rebuild a relationship. And, we, and, then, we, and then we put some actionable items together to help mitigate the problem in the future and to get you know, productive and more efficient communication. Can you give us a little bit more detail about the case that you're talking about? Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so we, we came into a, a mediation session and essentially my first thing is when I start a dialogue, I want to, I want to get to a place where everybody understands that they care about each other. That's, that's number one formula for me is if people don't feel they are cared for, this is going to go nowhere in terms of rebuilding a relationship. We might be able to just, handle a financial dispute. But if you want to rebuild a relationship, you both have to know that you care about each other and about the relationship. And so that's what I want to establish. And early on in the dialogue between these two sort of high powered executives who are very much like in their, um, in a, in a position where they're, they're not emotional and they don't, you know, I'm fine. Yeah. And I'm, that kind right. of thing. Um, I one I asked one of them to tell the other what, what they, um, what they really appreciate about this person. And she oh. went into a whole diatribe about what she, I wouldn't say a diet, but a whole, a whole lecture basically about what she appreciates about her boss in front of her. And the, and the boss did the same thing about the employee before I got into any of the conflict. And it, me, it, was, it was amazing because all of a sudden they both started to tear up. And one of them started like kind of crying and saying, I can't believe... I didn't, I thought you didn't like me. I thought you, I never knew you thought this about me. I never knew you even like recognized this stuff about me, all this stuff. And yeah, of course I recognize this. You're so valuable. And this, and it completely broke down the walls. And oh so, yeah, I can understand. Yeah. yeah so it was amazing to see these very high powered women who have a lot on their plate and they're very much in their conflict positions. And it's been going on for a year now where they just, they hardly talk anymore. All of a sudden, they're, they, they come back together in this moment of a, in the safe space that we can create together. 
And from there, we're able to effectively communicate and talk about the actual problems without judging each other and making presumptions. And so it was, it, that was a, I always reflect back on that and, and remember how powerful the process of gratitude, appreciation, and really connection and care are to the process of conflict resolution. And it's, and people are, when they hear that, sometimes they, they think, well, I don't want to go through that because people are just aren't in touch with that in themselves. But when you create a safe space for that dialogue to happen, just two people in a room with me, um, it's, it can be very powerful. I've done the same thing with, with, with male executives. And um, I see the same thing. As soon as they start to feel like, wow, this guy cares about, actually cares about me as a person, not just as a worker, and appreciates me and recognizes me, and they both think that, all of a sudden the walls break down and like, okay, we can, let's talk about how we make this work. And it actually works. And it's, and yeah. it's sustainable. Yeah. You know, I, I would think that in the world of business, uh, that there's often a kind of win-lose kind of mentality, right? Either, yeah. either or, black and white, win-lose. And, uh, and that, zero, yeah, they think it's a zero-sum game. Yeah, and the people might come into the situation kind of armored, right? They're absolutely used I, to yeah, oh, yeah. themselves against outside threat. Yeah, I have to. I have to protect myself exactly. It, whatever I, whatever he wins here, it means I lose. They don't. They so so that is another part of that process. Is we're in this dialogue together. I want to establish a sense of care, but I also want to establish the sense that we can come out of this thing with everybody winning on some level. We don't have to have a win-lose situation here. So everybody can walk out feeling more fulfilled, satisfied, et cetera. Um, and so when I when we when people start shifting that mindset, when they shift when they shift their perspective on how this relationship can be, it's not me or him or either or, it's now both of us together. It it's certainly another element that helps. Yeah, yeah. So how many sessions might something like the the thing that the situation that you described to us here? Uh, was was that like a one time? That was meeting? that one particularly was a yeah it was a one time session, and then I did some follow ups throughout throughout the next couple months, just on an individual basis. Hey, how are things going? Are the things we talked about working? Are they effective, et cetera? And it it stopped. I mean, it seemed I was very surprised. I was very impressed by that because they really did implement what we talked about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so and and I and I found the same thing, and, and it and sometimes they just need a little bit of a touch up. I find the same thing with another company that I continue to work with right now, where every you know maybe six months they need to tune up with the executives mm -hmm. to yeah. get you know, right. expectation. Um, but ongoing, I just sometimes kind of once a month follow up with the with the CEO, and I follow up with some of the other C level executives. Hey, how you doing? What's going on? If they have any problems, we can talk about it. But yeah, it seemed once we once we get that initial that lock broken, yeah, like locked into this this conflict psychology, this conflict identity. When we can break that and go, okay, let's create a new identity for this relationship. It's not about conflict anymore. It can be about cooperation. It can be about productivity. It can be about friendship. Even um, the it's, the the shift seems seems very powerful because it, it lasts. Does it ever? Are any of these situations uh, come down to more than just two people? Uh, oh, oh yeah, so you know, I think there might be a dysfunctional department or a dysfunctional yeah. division, and how do you approach that situation? Yeah, so so um, so this the the one I just talked about actually was multiple people. It was about five women. There was there was the CEO, and then there was this other C level who was like supposed to be the problem person, but then there were three other executives who were also involved in conflicts with each of them so i did interviews with each of them and then we do um and then i and i just did dyadic dialogues with e with each pair that i felt was necessary so i did you know a, a dialogue session with the ceo and the other and the other c level and then i did a dialogue session with the ceo and the other woman and then a, and then a dialogue with the two c level executive and so i i did a bunch of these little dialogues and that seemed to help a lot and then so, and then I can update the CEO and like, okay, this is what's everybody's agreed to and et cetera. So I did that now on a larger organization when there's a conflict, of, a culture of conflict where there's, it seems to be systemic conflict throughout an entire organization. So I, like I did, a, 
I did an organizational assessment uh, recently at a school, at an elementary school, because there was just a whole bunch of conflict. And in that case, what I'll do is like, I'll interview the principal, the vice principal, and some of, and like some of the, the admin alone. And then I'll do these group interviews, small group interviews with teams, like second grade department with like three or four, you know, um, teachers at once. And I'll do an interview and I'll just get all these notes about like what's going on. And then I'll present a, a whole report about all the themes that I'm seeing, right? Uh, in the, in the different departments and across. And, and if there's anything that I hear a lot from each department or each team, I'm going to, I report those in the report and I show them to the whole company. So everybody sees, I've noted what you said. I'm validating what you said. I uh -huh. reported and that's important. And then from there, I create a whole list of here's all the things that we could do to resolve this. We could do some coaching for the principal. We could do some facilitated dialogue. I can help facilitate meetings or et cetera. So, uh, so I give them like a laundry list of things of ideas that we can implement to start, uh, start changing things. And do you so ever do uh, retreats as part of that? I, off, I don't do retreats. retreats. Yeah, I, I do retreats, but not in my conflict consulting practice. I do, I do retreats with my coaching clients. Um, uh, so I, something separate like personal development retreats. But yeah, that's, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, maybe eventually I would do that. I just, I just, yeah, we can talk about this. I don't know if you're interested, but I, I just started a, I just, we're in beta testing right now on a, on a company that I just launched. Um, and it's basically taking conflict resolution, merging it with technology to scale it for large companies. Um, yeah, that sounds very interesting. So this yeah. is, this is a new area that you're going to move into yeah. with your business. Yeah, so my Pollock Peace Building, that's my consulting company. And then I have another business now that is beyond just consulting. It's actually like a, like a technology startup, essentially. That, uh -huh. that helps. So, 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 like, so what the idea is for that is called Optimize with two Ps. But um, what the idea is for that is um, my, my, the idea is that every, every challenge is an opportunity, essentially. And so my, what I'm trying to do is optimize culture to mitigate conflict. And what that does is, and this is what, and this is just based on the things that I found uh, through working with companies is number one, uh, in, employees at companies, when they have problems, a lot of times they don't feel that they can talk to their managers because that's a lot of times the manager is part of the problem and they don't want to go to HR because HR is basically on the company side. So that's what they feel like. And also HR, sometimes they don't feel like the HR does anything about it. They don't have the capacity or they don't have, they don't have the ability to rock the boat and do anything about it. Yeah, yeah. They don't want to report. Maybe they're they're They want it to be under wraps. They don't want a report made about what's going on and HR will make reports. And so it'll be documented. And so they like this idea of this third party independent sort of consultant that they can talk to very confidentially. Um, nothing gets reported. Nothing gets, there's no notes taken or anything like that. And they just get advice and how to work with it. And maybe they get a mediation, like a dialogue facilitation. And so I thought like, how do I take that and I do that on a large scale and, uh, and then create a value for the company. And so the opt that's, that's the idea what Optimize does is we provide on the one hand, we provide independent conflict resolution consultants who are experts um, in HR and conflict resolution so that employees can call my service and they can talk to a number of any, any number of uh, specialists. And then we have a proprietary way that we are developing to take data from those sessions, still keeping our, our clients that we talk to anonymous and confidential, but take the data and put it into an, an, an analytics for the company. So the company can then see a, a whole platform of analytics showing here's all the themes of conflict going on. Here's some departments that have a lot of conflict here. You know, so they, a whole long, a whole list of, potential conflicts and they can see all kinds of percentages about what types of things are going on in the company from these, but without knowing who's saying what or who's talking to whom. These are for bigger companies typically. Yeah. Yeah. So you would be presenting them with charts and diagrams yeah. that would show those relationships. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So part of the uh, challenge for you, or if I put myself in your shoes, yeah. Uh, is not aligning with not buying into the idea that it's this person's fault right if this person weren't here everything would be great that's what they think a lot and it's not true yeah it's not it's not always true i would say it's not always true 
Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times that perception is, is, is just framed through a particular perspective. Whereas it, it, it's, it's really, it's really about more than that. And it starts with, again, it starts with care. It starts with the fact that people don't feel cared about. They don't feel recognized or appreciated, et cetera. How do people find you? I mean, there's, yeah, I'll just leave it there. How do people find you? How do they come to that? I'm still in the corporate place, I guess, is yeah. wondering how does a business come to the place where they say we need outside help and, and yeah. somehow they find you? Uh, well, a lot of times they find me through my website. Um, the way that they, the, 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 typically when, I, when they come to me, it's because they're on their last straw before they have to either fire someone or they get into a lawsuit. Yeah. And, and I think it's because a lot of people don't know that this is from what I hear. I didn't realize this, but again, this is what I hear from clients when they contact me is they didn't know I exist. They didn't know that my type of service existed. They didn't know someone could come in and help me build a relationship without them just going straight to an attorney, you know, and figuring out, okay, how do we separate from this person financially? With uh, you know, um, So, so they get to this last straw where they go, is there anything else we can do before I have to get rid of this person? and potentially get into a lawsuit and whatever. Was there anything else I can do? And they start researching online, like, you know, workplace conflict uh, resolution or something like that. And then they find me. Yeah. yeah. I would think that there'd be some good word of mouth given what you're sharing with us. Yeah, yeah. I, I do refer, yeah, referrals are a big way too. Uh -huh. Yeah. So but I, I, I typically, when I, when I start working with companies, a lot of times I will do repeat business for them too. They, a lot of times I, I, Again, on a sometimes a retainer or sometimes just an ongoing program to help coach their employees or executives or even to just con do a consulting once a month or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering about that how the how you get paid. So it yeah. sounds like it, it varies. Yeah, it does vary. I mean, a lot of times it's like I I I I do like a, an hourly with a minimum if I do like just a one off mediation, but then sometimes mm -hmm. they won't retain me so they'll pay me like a monthly retainer to co coach a particular number of hours or something like that. Yeah. 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 So it's interesting that I can relate to some of what you're saying because I've done, I've done some work as a consultant to corporations around uh, market research and, mm -hmm. uh, and worked with another guy who was, uh, whose company it was, who was very gifted, I would say at doing this kind of thing. And so we come in and it would be about market research, but then there would be a retreat and looking at, well, what's working? You yeah. know, we, we have recommendations. Here's what you need to do to get your product out there and, and so on. But here's what's in the way. Ah. And uh, the so, forces, yeah, you see yeah. the forces against change or the forces against yeah. law. Yeah. So it sounds like you, I don't you've got more than one company going. Yeah. Uh, the one we were starting out talking about the peace building is in the name. Is that just you? Is that like a one person operation? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I do have a couple of consultants that I sometimes piece work out too. So I like, if I can't go and do a training, then I'll have one of, one of my colleagues go do it on my behalf as part of my company essentially. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so a lot, of, but a lot, but a lot of that's just me as a consultant. Is there a professional association that that you and people like you belong to, and, and is that a way to, that you meet other people that you would want to bring in? Absolutely, yeah. There's there's so there's a national association called the Association for Conflict Resolution, oh. and, and then there's and then there's chapters throughout the country. And so I'm actually um, I'm the I'm a I'm a committee chair in the Arizona Association for Conflict Resolution. So, um, so I, so I, I meet a lot of other conflict experts through that, through that association. And do you have conferences where there are trainings and guest trainings and so on to yeah. raise everybody's skill level? Yeah. Yeah. We have, our chapter does monthly webinar trainings, um, that anyone can join and, and, and we also, we put out a lot of different types of material and then the national organization has like, I think a once a year big conference with all the chapters and they do different speakers and trainings and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, there are people in my audience, I think, I, I know there are, are a number of therapists in my audience and people who are in training to be therapists. And 
what if somebody listening is sort of drawn to this area that we've been talking about? How would they find their way into it? It's a, it's a very interesting question. So I actually coach a couple of therapists that are becoming conflict resolution consultants. I, I do business coaching for them. So like, I basically am helping them launch their conflict resolution practice uh -huh. out of therapy. But, um, but yeah, so it's kind of a, it's what I do. But I would say that if they're interested in, it's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag between understanding the, the market for conflict resolution and also understanding how to market. And, and so I come, from a, I come from a content copywriting, content marketing background too. So that was what I was doing before I got into psychology and even during it, and I still do some of that as a consultant. Um, I, I consult with content, the uh, different brands for content strategy, because um, it's just something I like to do. Um, so uh, unpack that a bit for me. Uh, content yeah, so, strategy. Yeah, content strategy. So, 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 like basically, web, website content strategy. Um, how do I create a presence online for this niche or for this expertise that I want? How do I become the authority? And so, part of the strategy is it's developing an idea of what. What are people, what is your target market searching for? And how do we get to those searches? How do we get in front of the eyeballs? And mm -hmm. uh, so one way is obviously through your website and how do we create a strategy through your website? What are your services and how do you talk about your services and how do you, how do you optimize it for search engines and stuff like that? And then you're also doing other kinds of content like doing podcasts, like what I'm doing, for instance, or what other kind of content you're putting on YouTube videos or um, uh, who, you're, who are you partnering with strategically, um, other kinds of businesses that are, not competing, but still targeting your demographic. And so just a, a general strategy in terms of how do you create an authority in the digital space so that when people search for your kind of expertise in your area, they find you. And so that's what I help you. No with. wonder I liked your website. Because <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> that's what you're doing, that is what you've just described, and you put that kind of energy into it. and. Yeah that expertise. Yeah. yeah. I, I love doing, I love, I love consulting with companies to help them resolve conflicts. I also really like consulting or like coaching, uh, aspiring conflict resolution consultants. I I'm actually really enjoying that because I love business consulting. And I also, I, my mission is to create more peace in the world. And if I can do that through my own consulting, but also by coaching other consultants to get out there and do their work too, it serves my mission. So I love doing both. I was tempted to ask you <laughs> how you would uh, uh, work with uh, Trump and Pelosi. <laughs> oh. You know, I don't know if you want to address that or not. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I would have to, I don't know them. So I don't, I would have to know them as a person. But the thing is, but the yeah. thing is okay. that for, for people, anytime I, I do any kind of dialogue, Everyone has to buy into it. Everyone has to agree. You can't be mandated to participate. So when a CEO says, hey, I want, I, I want to resolve this conflict with these other people, or with, with this executive before I have to let them go, et cetera, I say, well, okay, then you need to email them or I need to email them and I need to make sure that they're up for it because I don't want, there's no way that this is going to work if you mandate them to do it. And so the part of the thing is, is that everybody involved in this, involved in a conflict resolution or a peace building process, they have to be willing to get to peace. They have to be wanting to get out of a conflict. I was, I was just saying that, yeah, people have to be willing to enter into a conflict resolution or a peace building process. And I think that a lot of times what happens is with particular cultures and, and even individuals that are stuck in these longer intractable conflicts, they, 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 get an, they form an identity around being in a conflict. And, uh, and, to, and to impact the conflict means they're essentially asking them to impact or even change part of their identity. That's what it seems like to them. And yeah. I think people like Trump and Pelosi, they might be in this situation where they feel that they have to be in a conflict with each other. Otherwise, it's not good for them politically or personally or whatever. And so they would have to both get to a place where like believing that they could get to peace and wanting to get to peace in order to even start a process, you know. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's, that that's where they they would be at. I don't know. Yeah, you're brave to uh, at least respond to that question. <laughs> so, so where would you like to, may I ask you, how old are you? You seem very young to me to be doing all this. Oh, I'm, I'm let's see, I'm, I'm two months away from being 40. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's relatively young, and it seems like you've really uh, 
Uh, I'm just impressed by the authority that you're able to wield uh, around all this material. Okay, yeah, and, I've been, yeah, yeah. I've been, uh, been very busy for the last 15 years. <laughs> I, can, I can believe that. Where do you uh, see yourself in five or 10 years, you know, if everything goes the way you want it to go? I think probably doing similar thing. I think probably a little bit less coaching and consulting on my own. And I, and I would hope that more running my conflict resolution company, which is optimized, um, may, maybe more day-to-day -day business, you know, just as a CEO of that company and then doing some consulting or coaching, you know, with clients that I've had for a long time on the side. Your optimized uh, company sounds like it will be bigger with yeah. more, more, you'll have employees or partners or something. Yeah, so I already have uh, like several conflict resolution specialists that are working for the company. Um, I have a technology part, a, a CTO that I just brought in, and then I'm, we're going to start building a, a, a team of, of executives to actually, like, yeah, it's going to be more run like an actual company. Yeah, yeah. okay. Well, uh, maybe we should wrap things up. I wonder if there's any sort of last statement that you'd like to make that, uh, what do you want the world to know? I, you know, I, I guess I would want the, I'd want the world to know, well, if in, in general, there's, there's always a path to peace. And, and if, even if you think that you're in a conflict that can't be resolved, even if you think there's no hope for this, if you have any desire to rebuild the relationship, there is most likely a way to do that if you really want it. So I, that's, that's what I would say. Well, that's a great message. And, and I hope that maybe as you grow, uh, maybe you'll take on some of those international challenges because uh, yeah. the world needs more peace and less conflict. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, so Jeremy Pollack, I want to thank you for being my guest today on Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed our conversation.